The Twelve Months. An awful woman lived with her daughter and stepdaughter in her household. She possessed feelings of hate for her stepdaughter Anna. Anna worked while her stepsister did nothing. On a cold January night, Anna's stepmother remarked, "Your stepsister desires flowers. Go and find some." Anna wasn't anxious to walk through the chilled landscape. The cold air made her lungs burn. She walked at a slow pace because of the snow. Soon she saw a group of people. It consisted of twelve men. Anna told them about the flowers. One of the men said they were the twelve months and that they would help Anna. January walked to her and made a motion with his hand. The days of the month passed rapidly until it was February's turn. February also made the month speed up. Then March made the sun shine, and flowers grew in the field. Anna loaded her basket with so many flowers that she could hardly lift it. Then she gave a quick but polite thank you to the twelve men and returned home. She was very eager to show her stepmother all the flowers. Back at the house, she spilled the flowers onto the table. Then she told her stepmother about the twelve men. Anna's stepmother and stepsister went to seek the twelve months. Their intent was to ask for gifts. They looked and looked. They became very lost and never found their way home. Anna lived happily by herself. The dragon. An evil dragon lived in a castle in the remote southern mountains. One day, the monster landed in a town. The dragon commanded the people, "Give me food now, or I will eat you." The dragon lifted its wings so that its lungs could be completely filled with hot steam, and breathed it upon the people. A man turned into a stone statue. The people submitted and brought food. The dragon ate all of it and laughed. The people sent a boy to ask for help from a wise old man. He resided in a temple. The boy told the old man about the dragon. Then the old man counseled the boy. A meteor will fall in the northern sky. It will make a huge explosion. Find the meteor and bring it to me. I will use it to make a sword for you. The boy did as the old man said. Soon the sword was ready. Use this to kill the dragon, but be careful. You must cover yourself with weeds that smell bad. That will ensure that he does not smell you, the man said. The boy traveled for many days to find the castle. He went to the upper level and opened a door. He could see the dragon's tail. It was sleeping, so the boy killed it. Then he took the dragon's gold and jewelry and returned to his town. The people were happy. The Battle of Thermopylae. This is a true story. It happened long ago in Greece. We must fight, the Spartan chief told his small army of brave men. They were at a great disadvantage. There were only three hundred of them. The Persian military had hundreds of thousands of men. They were going to lose unless they could secure a small entrance. The enemy couldn't move through it easily. They intended to stop the enemy here. The chief and his men got ready for the battle. Soon, long lines of the enemy's army twisted around the hills. The chief met the enemy with laughter. He knew that his men's weapons and skills were better. The Spartans trusted their leader and obeyed him. First, the enemy soldiers shot arrows from their bows. The chief told his men to lift their shields. The arrows stuck into the shields but did not hurt any of the men. Then the enemy soldiers attacked the Spartans with long spears. The chief surprised them. His troops rolled logs down on the enemy. They fought for three days, though they hardly slept at all.
the chief and his men remained steady. But the enemy found a way to beat the Spartans. The chief and all of his men were killed. Even though they lost, the Battle of Thermopylae is one of the most famous battles in history. The Deer and His Image A deer told himself every day, I am the most handsome deer in the forest. My large chest is a symbol of my power, and my beautiful horns impress other animals. But he did not like his legs and hooves. My legs are narrow, and my hooves are ugly. They do not satisfy me. One day, the deer saw a big dog. The deer made some noise and disturbed the dog. The dog woke up and chased him. The deer felt terror. He screamed. He did not want to be a victim, so he ran into the forest. His strong legs helped him run fast. His pale brown hooves were hard, so they were not sensitive to rough rocks. However, his horns got caught in branches, slowing him down. His large chest could not fit between thick trees. The deer estimated that he ran for an hour. He felt like he was running a marathon. In the end, the deer escaped the threat of the dog. He sat in the shade of a tree. That was almost a disaster. I almost did not escape because of my chest and horns. My legs and hooves saved me. As a consequence, the deer learned to honor his fast legs and have confidence in his strong hooves. Pretty things only supplement important things, he thought. May 29, 1953 Today is the most important day of my life. I finally climbed Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world. The top of the mountain was amazing. It felt like we were close to heaven. The snow was so thick that my boots sank. The air was silent. I looked at the beauty that surrounded me. Maybe my story will be a legend someday. I want people to remember this forever. I was the senior explorer in my group, and I knew we needed proof of our climb. I took many pictures with my camera. I'll put them in a frame and hang them. On the mountain, the air was very cold. I wrapped my coat around my body. I looked over the side of the mountaintop. From that angle, I saw the border of the clouds touch the rocks below. The snow was thick. It looked pure. There was no sign of modern life. Thousands of years ago, my ancestors saw the world this way. After fifteen minutes, I knew it was time to proceed down the mountain. The whole team congratulated us. My superior, John Hunt, praised us all. I sent messages to my relatives to tell them that I was safe. But it was hard to leave the mountain so quickly. I wanted to enjoy the incredible sight even longer. The Frog Prince A lovely princess sat by the pool and played with a sculpture of a bear. Suddenly, she dropped it, and it rolled away. She chased it, but it fell into the water. She began to cry. A large, ugly frog asked, Why are you crying? After the princess told him, the frog said, I can get the sculpture. What will you give me in exchange for the favor? I can pay you a fee in gold, she said. But the frog protested, I want to sleep in your bed, and you must kiss me in the morning. He'd die without water, so I don't have to keep my promise, she thought. The frog dove for a brief moment and got the sculpture. Then the princess ran away with it. Later, the frog went to the palace. The king told her to keep her promise. This put the princess in a bad mood. She permitted the frog to sleep on her pillow. In the morning, she gave him a kiss. Suddenly, he turned into a guy. He said, I'm from a kingdom abroad. In my youth, I angered a tribe of cruel witches who turned me into a frog. The princess asked him, 
Can I be your bride and stay with you forever? But the prince said, No, you disappointed me. You didn't keep your promise. A Beautiful Bird Dr. Norton's occupation was a scholar of biology. He learned about all animals on a daily basis. One day he met a sailor from a colony overseas. The man told Dr. Norton about a talking bird. The bird fascinated Dr. Norton, so he told his colleagues about it. They debated with him. No one thought a bird could talk. He tried to persuade them, but they laughed at him. Nevertheless, Dr. Norton believed the bird was real. His new mission was to find it. He wanted factual proof. The next day he departed for the colony. The sailor he had met told him to look for a man named Jai, who would be able to help him in his search. After a month of sailing, Dr. Norton finally reached the colony where he met Jai. I can take you to where it lives. It lives by the volcano, Jai said. They left the next day. A week later, they arrived at the volcano. Every day they walked around and looked for the bird, but they couldn't find it. After one month, Dr. Norton could not find the bird, and this depressed him. He decided to go home. On the route back, he walked past some old ruins. He heard someone say, Hello. Who are you? he asked. Dr. Norton looked up and saw a bird. Dr. Norton put the talking bird into a cage. Then he returned home. He had made a significant discovery. Tricky Turtle Ricky the Rabbit and Tara the Turtle met by the edge of the river. No one is capable of beating me in a race, Ricky said. He was confident. His smile conveyed that. I can beat you, Tara said. Ricky laughed with delight. Tara said, We will race tomorrow. The destination is the hill. Ricky agreed. Tara concentrated on winning the race. She was not faster than Ricky. She needed a definite way to succeed. She told her family about the race. I have concluded that I have to resort to something bad. I will cheat. She dictated her instructions to them. At the race, they all wore white feathers. They looked exactly the same. Then her family members hid in shadows on the path. The race began. Tara was soon far behind. However, Tara's brother hid behind a bush in the valley below. When Ricky got close, Tara's brother began to run. He looked just like Tara. Ricky ran as fast as he could along the path. But to him, it seemed like Tara was always ahead. Ricky had used a considerable amount of energy. He reached the top but Tara's sister was already there. Well, you win, Ricky said. Later, Tara had a broad smile on her face. Ricky never suspected. He had been tricked by a family of slow turtles. The Tale of Bartleby O'Boyle Long ago, there was a clever man by the name of Bartleby O'Boyle. As a boy, he was kept as a slave by the royal family. He saw other children play, but he always had to work. This frustrated him very much, but he was not stupid, and he wanted to change things. Then one day there was a struggle for authority in the kingdom. There was a division of the people, and one group fought against another group to see which would govern the kingdom. There was disorder in the kingdom. Bartleby ran away. He saw much fighting and destruction. Many people had nothing to eat. Bartleby decided to aid them. He would help them get food. But how? Bartleby went to the capital to find an answer. There, he met a man named Gilliam. A group of men attempted to hurt Gilliam. Bartleby defended him. Then he gave Gilliam some food to relieve his hunger. After that, 
the two became friends. They took food from the rich and gave it to the poor. Soon, other people cooperated with them. Working together enabled them to take more food. But they only took food from people who had plenty, and they always gave it to those who had none. Because of this, Bartleby gained a reputation across the kingdom. Even today, many people admire him for helping the poor. Blackbeard A long time ago, I had my first job. It didn't give me much of an income. It was on a giant pirate ship. On my first night, there was a thick fog over the water. A lamp on the ship revealed an enormous man. He had a sword in his belt. His name was Blackbeard, and he was one of the most violent pirates ever. One day, Blackbeard did an extraordinary thing. He attacked several ships near a town. He took some of the town's citizens. Then he declared, You give me medicine. Blackbeard wanted the medicine for some of the sick pirates on his ship. The people had a bad impression of him. They were mad, and they resisted. But they were trapped. They wanted to get rid of him. So the town's council decided to give him the medicine. After this, there was a reward for catching Blackbeard. If Blackbeard was caught, he would have a trial. He didn't want to go to jail, so he quit being a pirate. Blackbeard became a fisherman. But he ought to have stayed on land. The Royal Navy was still looking for him. They attacked him while he was fishing on his boat. Blackbeard fought against many men. Finally, he was killed. He didn't even get a funeral. But people still tell tales about him many years later. Dinosaur Drawings It was the worst morning ever. When Carl woke up, he realized that he didn't do his astronomy and chemistry homework. Also, the forecast called for rain, and that would affect baseball practice. Suddenly, his mother yelled, Take out the garbage right now! When Carl returned from taking the garbage outside, he was all wet. What a terrible day, he said. He walked to class. He put his umbrella on the shelf and sat in the third row. But the teacher asked why Carl's umbrella was on the floor. He told her not to blame him, but she sent him to the principal out of spite. Next, he took a geography test. Despite studying, Carl didn't know the answers. He started drawing lightly on his paper. Carl drew a huge dinosaur. What if it were real? He saw it in his mind. Carl's class said he was a genius for having a dinosaur. It could interfere with math class, too. Soon, Carl's fame spread through school. He taught his dinosaur to be very gentle and put it on exhibit. But admission would only be given to those classmates who paid him a fee. His idea was super. It's time to turn in your tests, the teacher said. Carl looked at his paper. As he was dreaming in class, he hadn't finished the test. The Mean Chef Once, there was a chef who was mean to his cooks. He was mean to the people who came in to eat. He charged too much for meals. Many people were not able to afford the cheapest bean dish. When his metal oven broke, he did not have it fixed. So everything baked and it burned. The only light was from candles. And the whole place was a mess. Sometimes, he didn't pay his waiters. Since they had no funds, they had many debts. The chef behaved this way all the time. He monitored the cooks and yelled if they did not do things his way. One day, the cooks decided that they were tired of the abuse and that they would not be passive anymore. Everyone opposed the chef. At first, they thought about suing him. Instead, they tied up the chef with rope. Now they controlled the restaurant. They decreased the price of food. 
They used the best ingredients and made large quantities of food. They turned on the lights. The restaurant was converted into a happy place. For the first time, many people came to eat. The chef realized that the restaurant's problems were his fault. The chef learned an important lesson. The new generous chef insisted on giving the customers a free meal. The Cat and the Fox One day, a cat hiked on a mountain. When he reached the peak, he met a fox. They began talking about how they get away from their enemies. I am very smart. I have billions of ideas. I can carve a tiny hole in a tree and then climb in, the fox said. He added, I have a lot of friends. If I am in trouble, I can call them to lend their help. I can escape an entire army if I have to. Then the fox asked, What are your potential plans? The cat said, I have only one plan. The fox said, I hope you have good fortune then. Do you want me to be your tutor? I can teach you many things. The cat said, I guarantee that my plan works every time. We can quit talking about it. Soon, they saw a group of wolves. It was an emergency. The cat quickly used her plan. She ran up a tree. The fox could not decide which plan to use. What should my initial move be? Should I consult my friends? The fox felt intense anxiety. All he could do was spin in a circle. The wolves caught the fox. The cat was full of pride. This is proof that having a good plan is better than having many bad plans. The Good Student Sue left her dormitory early that morning. She had even washed her uniform the night before. She wanted to look nice for the day. Sue was committed to learning, and she had a talent for getting good grades. In fact, Sue didn't sleep much. She composed a paper and found the perfect thesis about the importance of greenhouses. She also studied for her physics test. Sue was already tired. During the test, she calculated her answers. Soon, she felt sick. Her face got hot, and her vision began to blur. She was blind for a moment. The teacher saw Sue's apparent sickness. He wanted to send her to the nurse, but she wouldn't go. Sue still had a portion of the test to finish. After that, Sue went to the nurse. After seeing the secretary, she waited. A few minutes later, the nurse came in with a glass of juice and told Sue they needed to chat. It is obvious you have exhausted yourself, the nurse said. If you keep working so hard, it could have severe results. My parents tell me that all the time. I guess I shouldn't ignore them, Sue said. You have to remind yourself it is okay to rest, the nurse said. When Sue got back to her room, she went right to bed. She made sure she got enough rest every night after that. The Lucky Knife I've devoted my life to studying past generations. Last year, I had a unique chance to work with my uncle. Our job was to find old treasures for a school's history foundation. He also hired a crew of students. They signed a contract to work with him. He was the boss. The place was strange, though. I dined on many things that I had never tasted before. They had an unusual flavor. We had been there about a month and hadn't found anything. One day, I began to dig in the soil. The ground's layers got wetter. Soon, I was digging in the mud. My shovel began to get very heavy. It felt like it had doubled in weight because the ground had absorbed a lot of water. Finally, I saw something in the mud. It was an old knife. The handle felt smooth in my hand. I elevated it so I could see it better. There was writing on it. It says it will bring good luck, my uncle said with a smile. 
Why don't you keep it? I put it in my tent. The next day, we found many more things. There were pots, jewelry, and weapons. My uncle donated all of the things to a special committee. Many newspapers wrote stories about it. It seemed the knife really did bring good luck. Prince Sam. Sam's mother cooked at the royal palace. One day, he went to work with her. She emphasized that he should stay in the kitchen. But Sam was bored. Thus, he decided to look around. He went around a corner. It shocked him to see a boy who had a strong likeness to him. Sam soon recovered. The other boy stared at him. Then he spoke. Come with me. He needed to be rational, but he couldn't deny that he wanted to go. So he followed the boy to a chamber. I am Prince Bertram, the boy said. Sam felt shy talking to a prince. I'm Sam. Trade places with me, the prince said. We can't. My mother will kill me. Moreover, I don't know anything about being a prince. No one will find out. The prince interrupted. We look the same, and even our gestures are the same. It will only last for a week. Sam said okay. Soon, Sam's perspective on being a prince changed. He spent most of his day signing royal documents. At night, the prince's chamber was cold. He thought he was going to freeze or get sick with a fever or the flu. He was happy when the week ended. So was the prince. I didn't know how to do anything, the prince said. I've always relied on my servants to do everything for me. I think I like being a regular person, Sam said. Being a prince isn't fun. So, they both returned to their normal positions and enjoyed their lives more than before. Henry Ford's Famous Car My name is Henry Ford. And I invented a car called the Model T. I used to watch carriages on the streets. They fascinated me. Then I got a job as a junior mechanic. My father criticized me. He wanted me to run the farm. But I did not shift my plans. Then I worked for the Detroit Auto Company. But I wanted to make cars using less labor. That way, there would be fewer expenses. I started the Ford Motor Company in 1903. At first, the company did not do well, but many people were betting on my success. I also had a sincere aim to make a car that anybody could buy. Then in 1908, I introduced the Model T in a formal ceremony. It confirmed that I was right. It was possible to build a car my way. The Model T differed from other vehicles. Workers could attach different parts for cars or trucks. This saved time. One Model T could be put together in 93 minutes. All of them had the same classic design. They were all the same size and height. The prime reason for doing this was to save money. Over 19 years, I sold over 15 million Model Ts. This sent a signal to other companies. People would buy cars to commute to work if the price was low enough. The priest. A young priest was always sad. He was good at his profession, but he still had no joy. He visited a group of wise monks. When he got to the monk's house, they greeted him and let him in. The monks asked the priest, What is the matter? The priest said, I should be happy, but I am not. I don't know what to do. The wise monks paused for a minute. Then one said, We are convinced of your faith. You are a very good priest. But to find joy, you have to do more. Above all, investigate the elements of your life that you love. The priest thought that this answer was odd, but he was curious. The next day, the priest thought about his abilities. He got a few ideas, and he did not want to delay any longer. He liked to draw, so he made some cartoons. He also liked to write, so he started a diary. He was interested in agriculture, so he planted some grains. 
He made jam from berries. He made his own labels to put on the jars of jam. He painted his ceiling. The priest learned something. It is not too hard to be happy after all. All one has to do is find things they like doing and do them. Mrs. May and the Green Girl. One morning, people from a small town found a little girl by a stream. She seemed to be wearing a green costume. As the people got closer, they saw that the girl's skin was green. Oh my! The people exclaimed, "What if her motive for coming to our town is bad? What if she has a strange origin?" An old woman kindly went to her. "Look how scared she is! Please," she begged, "do not reject her. I will adopt her." There was silence until the judge spoke. "I don't know," he said in a worried tone, "but we cannot forbid you. I indeed hope you're not being a fool." Mrs. May extended her hand to the girl. "Come with me. I won't hurt you." The girl spoke a language Mrs. May didn't know, but she was able to interpret what the girl was trying to say. Sometimes the girl drew pictures to illustrate what she meant. The green girl was from a place far beyond the sun. There, people lived in nests built in trees. They only ate green leaves, which made their skin green. Well, you can't just eat leaves," Mrs. May said. She fed the green girl home-cooked meals, and soon the girl wasn't green any more. The people had a huge reception to welcome her as a citizen of the town. Albert Einstein. My name is Albert Einstein. Many people know about the great things I've accomplished. But I had many barriers before I became famous. I was born in Germany. When I was in elementary school, I already knew about math and statistics. When I was a boy, I pretended to be a great scientist. I loved school, but my life at home was hard. My father lost his job, so my family lived in poverty. We could not pay the rent in Germany. We became immigrants and went to Italy. I finished high school and went to college in Switzerland. After college, I began writing about science. I did not reach success in an instant, though. At first, other scientists did not approve of my work. They thought I was a failure. Rising to the rank of an admired scientist was a gradual process. Soon, people started to notice that I was right. At last, I began to get some recognition. I showed how to find the approximate size of very big things, like stars. I also detected and explained the movement of very small things, like atoms. And for fun, I made a machine that could refrigerate food by inserting heat. I never retired. It was my duty to keep working. I overcame many hard times, and I will be remembered for my important works. From the Earth to the Stars, Jeremy was from a family of miners. Like them, he worked underground during the day. His job was to gather raw minerals and jewels. Each night after work, he lay awake in an open field. With his telescope, he looked at the stars. He was amazed by the scale of space. He wished some day he might travel there. One day, there was an accident in the mine. Water poured into the mine. Everything was dark. Jeremy stretched out and grabbed a piece of wood. It kept him from sinking. Jeremy felt a presence nearby. "I am an angel," said a voice. "What?" Jeremy exclaimed. "You must never come underground again. Have the courage to make your wishes come true." For a long time, he floated in silence. Then he heard other voices. The other miners were coming to rescue him. The next day, Jeremy skipped work. He decided to become an astronaut. For the next two years, he studied hard. One day, he was given permission to participate in a mission to space. His wish had been granted. His spaceship left the ground. 
It went higher until there was no more gravity. He saw satellites floating next to the ship. Then Jeremy saw a beautiful angel outside his spaceship. It smiled at Jeremy. For some minutes, Jeremy could not speak. Finally, he said, Thank you. The Farm Festival Once there was a farm. Many animals lived there. One day, they had a contest in the yard. They were going to race from the barn to the farmer's garage. The barn and the garage were far apart. It would be a long race. The winner qualified to win a bag full of apples as an award. But the race did not start well. The cart with all the apples was not stable, and the animals had to repair it. Then the pup knocked over the apples. The pig yelled, We are going to slip. We must clean up this mess. The pup felt bad, and she began to cry. The dog gave her a tissue to wipe her tears. Then the race resumed. But the duck tried to rob them and take all the apples. The cat said, I will have you arrested. The duck said, You can't convict me. You can't prove I took it. The race stopped yet again. The animals tried to race one more time. Then they heard an alarm coming from the barn. There was a fire. They got buckets of water to put out the fire. A journalist came to write a story about the festival and the race. The horse told her, I am a special breed of horse. I would have won the race easily. The pig said, It was somewhat hard to have the race, but we had fun. That is what's important. The Clever Thief A new king inherited a lot of gold. He loved his gold very much. He even wanted to keep it after he died. Therefore, he had a large tomb built for himself and his riches. However, the tomb's builder had a plan. Most of the stones were solid, but he put one special stone on the roof. It was made of a lighter substance. When the tomb was done, the king moved in his stock of gold. One night, the builder went to the tomb. His excitement mounted. Because all the stones looked alike, he had left a distinct mark on the artificial block. The mark helped him distinguish the difference in the architecture. The builder lifted the stone. Using a chain, he climbed into the tomb. He filled his pockets with gold. The builder followed this manner night after night. Soon, the king noticed a shortage in his gold. This annoyed the king. At last he hired a guard to hide inside the tomb. When the builder entered the tomb, the guard wounded him. He climbed a pole to the roof. The builder left drops of blood in the dust. The guard followed them and caught him. When the builder healed, he explained to the king that he didn't keep any of the gold. He had given it all away to the poor. The Doctor's Cure James Fry was a fantastic doctor. His surgeries helped many disabled people overcome their injuries. He also wrote for a popular medical journal. James was very busy. His son Steve rarely saw him. One day, James was walking and inspecting a patient's file. There was water all over the floor. James slipped on the liquid and fell. He fell on a broken glass tube. He was hurt. Steve came to visit him in the hospital. James said, It will be tough for me to stay in bed, but I can hardly bend my legs. Then let's watch a movie, Steve said. It made them laugh together. Steve said, I have to leave, but here's some fiction to read. James started to recall fun parts of life. He marveled at small things, like food. He was too busy to notice them before. Steve, he said, you get more nutrients when you chew slowly. But I think it makes food taste better, too. Weeks later, James said, Steve, I haven't spent enough time with you. I regret this. Even my soul feels better when you visit. But I have spent sufficient time here. We should go home. 
Outside there was a warm breeze. James watched a flag blow. Finally, James said, I'm not ready to work. I'm going to take a long bath. And then we'll watch a movie together. The Criminal A man had been in jail because he stole things. The criminal never felt bad. One day, he escaped and ran into the woods. He found a cabin with a fence. The cabin was very neat. Inside, the criminal found a bowl of fruit, a bottle of milk, and a dozen eggs. He ate the fruit and drank the milk. But the eggs smelled funny, so he put them in the trash bin. Soon, he heard the sound of a vehicle's motor. An old man came in and saw the criminal. The old man yelled, Why are you in my house? The criminal lied. I am a policeman. The old man replied, I am your elder. You cannot fool me. You are the criminal. The criminal's facial expression became very sad. He admitted that he was a criminal. He said, I'm sorry. It was rude for me to come into your home. Please take the cash from my wallet. It is a mere amount, but it will settle our problem. The old man said, I do not want your money. I just want to inspire you to be good. There will be no penalty for taking my food. On this occasion, the criminal realized that he had been bad. He listened to the old man and never stole from anyone ever again. The Two Captains Once there were two ships. Both ships carried cotton. The captains were very different. Thomas was strict. He made his crew engage in difficult tasks. Make sure the ship's deck is firm and that nothing falls. Put more fuel in the tank, he said. His ship was very plain, but he never had a problem with it. The second captain, William, was not serious. He had a grand ship, and he loved having fun. His crew amused him by singing and dancing. But his crew never fixed anything on the ship. They just wanted to surf. One day, Thomas saw a hurricane ahead. He knew that his ship needed to turn around. But he was sure William did not see the storm. He adjusted the dials on the radio and called his friend. Thomas said, You'll hit the reef. It's made completely of coral. Turn around to ensure that you do not crash. William said, We will go under the deck and shut the door. We will dance and sing until we are past the danger zone. When William's ship got to the hurricane, the wind blew it into the reef. The ship crashed, and water flowed below the deck. William's crew accused him of being a bad captain. The loss of the ship taught William a lesson. There are times to have fun, but there are also times to be serious. The Duke and the Minister A mean duke grew tobacco, and his cardinal rule was to always keep the plants healthy. The duke's top minister was his twin brother. They closely resembled each other. One day, the tobacco plants started to die. He hired men to watch the fields. Soon, the men brought a woman to him and said, We captured a witch. The duke asked, How do you know? She sang magic words. I can't pronounce them. She has cursed us. The death of the plants is a symptom of her curse, the men said. I am just an ordinary woman. I was singing a song in a different language, the woman protested. The duke didn't listen. You are guilty. You will go to jail. The minister thought that she was innocent. He needed to expose the truth. He asked the duke to loan him one of his plants. He looked at it closely. He saw hundreds of small bugs eating it. Then the minister went to the jail and did something bold. Let this woman go, he said. The guards thought he was the duke. They let her go. The minister said, I owe you an apology. Thank you. I thought my stay in jail was permanent, the woman answered. The minister thought the duke would punish him, but he didn't. The duke was too busy trying to preserve his plants. The Fisherman 
Every day, a fisherman sat on a bridge. He ate apples and spit the seeds into the water. He had a simple way to catch fish. He cut a branch off of a tree and tied a line to it. He put a sharp hook on it and made a tight knot. Then he whispered, Come here, fish. Like magic, the fish bit the hook. He put them in a big net and took them home to make big pots of fish soup from them. One day, another man walked up to him. He said, My name is George. I am staying at the inn. I bet that I am a better fisherman than you. I will accompany you today. I dare you to prove your skill. The fisherman cast his line. George had a lot of electronic tools. One machine gave him the virtual locations of fish. His rod weighed fish. At the end of the day, George subtracted his fish from the fisherman's. The fisherman had beaten him by 47. George asked, How do you catch fish with only a branch and a bare line? I have many different sorts of tools. The fisherman told George, My philosophy is simple. I am patient, and I believe in myself. Take a breath, and try it my way. Osiris and the Nile Long ago, Osiris was the king of Egypt, and Isis was the queen. They ruled the fertile land by the Nile River. They ruled the fertile land by the Nile River. They had great intelligence, and they shared their abstract ideas with everyone. Osiris taught the Egyptians how to make wheels and furniture. Isis taught them how to make things from clay and cloth. The people thought they deserved a gift. So they built Osiris and Isis a pyramid. Everyone loved Osiris except his brother Set. Set wanted to be king. Osiris made his annual trip around Egypt and led religious events. The villages gave him beautiful shells and colorful feathers as gifts. When Osiris returned, Set brought a beautiful wooden box from behind a curtain. If someone fits inside this box, I will give it to him or her, Set said. Osiris got in it. It was an ideal fit. Suddenly, Set closed the box and threw it into the river. Now I will be king, Set said. The box washed up on a foreign shore after a flood. Isis brought his body home and obtained a grave for him in Egypt. The Egyptian gods thought Isis had done something very romantic. Because of her love, the gods made him the god of the underworld. Osiris returned every spring to help the farmers. Even nowadays, people say Osiris keeps their crops alive. The Taxi Driver Peter's job was driving a taxi downtown. He made a small salary. But he liked his job because it wasn't dull. Every day he saw new things that appealed to him. Peter was practical about the future. Maybe I can get a scholarship to college, he thought. I could learn mathematical formulas and get a job at a bank. I could help clients invest their money. Peter stopped to pick up a passenger. Where to? he asked. Go to the 4th Street Bank and don't talk to me. I've had a rough day, the man said. Peter was angry, but he had a peaceful philosophy. When they stopped, the man's fare came to $10.25. He put his hands in his pockets. I can't find my wallet, he said. I can't pay the fare. Peter said, Maybe I'll give you a temporary loan. You can borrow ten dollars and a quarter from me. The man was embarrassed, saying, I was mean to you, but now I want to help you. I founded this bank. I want to give you one thousand dollars. That much money was like a treasure to Peter. The man urged him to take the money, but he didn't. You're an honest person, the man said. I assumed you would take it. I want you to work for me. The next day, Peter started his job at the bank. He was happy to be done with his former job. Thank you.